So welcome to the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and the Hong Kong Canada Business Association's eighth annual Trans-Pacific Entrepreneurial Conference. I have today uh, our seventh seven, uh, session. Um, I have a fireside chat with Jeff Nankerville. My name is Alex Tam. I am external vice chair of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And in my day job, I am managing director for CIBC in Asia Pacific. I will be moderating this discussion with Jeff and uh, please note during the discussion, if you have any questions or comments, you can use our chat box. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Jeff Nankerville. Jeff is president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation. Uh, Foundation ASSI Asia Pacific to Canada, my poor French there. As many of you will already know <laughs> and are familiar with Jeff, uh, he is a career diplomat uh, in Canada's Foreign Service for over 30 years and recently uh, left Canada's Foreign Service. Uh, and uh, just prior to that, he was the Council General uh, from 2016 to 2021 in Hong Kong. So many of you are very familiar with Jeff. Uh, he is fluent in English and French, obviously, but also in Mandarin, and he also speaks some Cantonese. So Jeff, you're back on the West Coast, uh, in Canada, in my hometown, Vancouver, <laughs> <laughs> out of the civil service. We're now leading the Asia Pacific Foundation. How are you doing? Well, ni hao, Alex, and bonjour uh, tout le monde. Uh, da ga ho. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's been great. I've never, unlike you, I've never lived in Vancouver before. I'm uh, a Toronto born and raised and then for 33 years, I spent about half of my life in uh, in Beijing and Hong Kong, and half in Ottawa. So it's the first time to actually live in in Vancouver, and I and I'm loving it. And the foundation is a terrific place to work, and it's a, an incredible time to work on Canadian engagement uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So I'm I'm having a blast. Oh, indeed. So. But you you were in Hong Kong for five years. There must be. Do you miss Hong Kong? Do you miss Asia? I do. I do miss. I I miss. I miss Hong Kong. I mean, I loved Hong Kong. We had we had two postings in Hong Kong. One of our two sons was born there. Uh, I have. Uh, it was just a, a terrific experience in Hong Kong, in spite of all the challenges that we all lived through. Um, I miss. It may it may sound strange for someone uh, talking to you from Vancouver. But I do actually miss the, the scenery of Hong Kong, the country parks, the harbor, uh, the, the country walks that you can do. And, uh, and I miss the, the incredible people in Hong Kong, the mix of people and the buzz of Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong that I knew uh, between uh, 2016 and 2021. And, uh, and I've missed seeing a lot of uh, friends who are uh, perhaps taking, taking part in this conference. And it's the... Uh, this is the sixth time that I've been a part of this conference. So, you know, I, I miss these engagements. Oh, that's, that's interesting. So now back to uh, where you are now, what's been the most surprising thing to you about moving back to uh, Canada? Well, initially I, I moved back at the end of May and I have to say, it'll sound strange now, but initially um, the way people uh, were handling themselves with regard to COVID, um, was was at that time, I think back to last uh, May, June, was actually more serious in Canada than it was in Hong Kong. So I had to adjust a bit to, um, you know, people you want, you'd want to go and, and um, say hi to friends and they would say, well, maybe, you know, they, like two households can't be mixing and so on. So at the time, that was a, that was a bit of, of an adjustment. And then um, uh, certainly one thing I did not anticipate uh, in Canada was that we would have um, about uh, five months after I got back, we would have, you know, civil unrest in Canada with mm. uh, the truckers convoy and the occupation yeah. in Ottawa and, uh, and um, uh, you know, a, a brief but, but serious threat to some of our key supply lines uh, for Canada. I, I really didn't expect uh, that to happen. So, but you know that already is in the rearview mirror now. It seems like a long time ago, and uh, and you know life uh, life is back to normal here. Yeah, a bit of deja vu. Since the protests are following <laughs> you wherever you go, <laughs> but 
But hey, yeah. tell us about uh, what you're doing now. Tell us about the Asia Pacific Foundation. So the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada was founded in 1984 through an act of parliament, the Asia Pacific of Canada Act, uh, Foundation Act, um, and with bipartisan support um, uh, in parliament. And then um, in 2005, the foundation was provided with an endowment from the federal government, initially at uh, 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 $50 million. And the core funding for the endowments operations comes from the income and the growth of the endowment, which now stands between 75 and $80 million. Um, and, uh, and the foundation's mandate from the start, and I have to say it seems more relevant today than, than ever, is to be a catalyst to help Canadians to engage better with the Asia Pacific region and to help uh, people and institutions in the, uh, and businesses in the Asia Pacific region to engage better with Canada. And uh, that, was, uh, that was the idea back in the mid 1980s of starting the foundation. And, uh, and it's grown over the years. And uh, as I think we, you know, we'll be discussing, 2022, I think is gonna be a big year for Canadian engagement in Asia. And the foundation you know, sits, sits right at the, at the heart of that. We have uh, kind of three main lines of business. Uh, we have a substantial program of research uh, that is generating analysis, um, advice for Canadian uh, businesses, for Canadian governments, for uh, the Canadian public generally on, uh, on how to improve engagement in Asia. We have uh, a line of business where we support networks that help to convene uh, groups of, uh, uh, for mutual interest of people from Canada and Asia. An example of that would be uh, something that the foundation uh, created about five years ago, which is the, um, uh, the Asia Business Leaders Advisory Council, which is a group of about two dozen C-suite executives, business leaders from Canada, from Canadian um, financial institutions and, and firms, and uh, about two dozen C-suite uh, business leaders from around Asia who have some kind of a, an interest uh, in, you know, in talking to Canadians. And this is the kind of, the kind of network that, that we support. We also have a role uh, given to us by the government of Canada that came along with the endowment funding in 2005 to serve as the Canadian Secretariat for several networks uh, connected with the APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Institutions, uh, a private sector uh, network called the APEC Business Advisory Council. And um, uh, so we are doing the, the research and networks. And then we also work in education to develop and to uh, disseminate a curriculum on Asia for Canadians to, and to try to help build the competency of Canadians for dealing with Asia at a time when Canadian prosperity uh, is going to depend more than ever on being able to identify and, and benefit from opportunities in, in Asia. So we have teams at the foundation who are involved in, in all those things with partners in the private sector, the public sector, uh, we have international development projects that we're doing in Asia funded by the government of Canada. Um, and we have two, two offices. Our head office, uh, where I'm, I'm speaking from now, is in Vancouver. Uh, that, that, that was established under the, under the Act of Parliament. We have about 30 uh, people here. And then we have about a dozen people in a smaller office in Toronto uh, to manage various projects and engagements uh, in that part of the country. And um, uh, so there's, you know, every week there's, there's something new going on that, that, that we're engaged in. And uh, one thing in particular, I would encourage people to go to our website, asiapacific.ca, and, uh, and to subscribe to a newsletter type product that we put out twice a week called Asia Watch, which is a distillation uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays of just four items from around Asia that our team, uh, research team has selected. And we just have a very concise three paragraph description of, of the news item with some links that you can follow up for details, but with really a focus on you know, what's significant about 
the story and what does it mean for Canadian interests and you know, where can people who are interested find other information. So these are these are the kinds of things we're involved with on a on a day to day basis. Well, that's very interesting, uh, Jeff. Uh, but in spite of all the uh, challenges in the world today, um, especially with COVID, uh, the war in Ukraine between Ukraine and Russia, uh, we're still seeing a lot more news uh, in the last couple of years on uh, Asia Pacific, uh, on China, uh, in commerce and trade and in investments, uh, geopolitical climate. It's not all been rosy, but as you said, it's, it's, it's a big year for Canada for Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, what does it mean for Canadians? What does it mean for businesses and Canadians in Asia? So uh, the, you know, the main reason that I say it, it's gonna be a big year is that the, the government of Canada has been promising, actually for a few years now, but this year really it's going to happen. Uh, the government has been promising to launch uh, what they're calling an Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and it's the reason I'm confident that it's going to happen is because the, the foreign minister, Melanie Jolie, who was appointed uh, after the last election uh, in the Liberal cabinet, um, she has this as a very prominent item in her mandate letter from the prime minister. Uh, she has talked about it. And even at a time when the war is happening uh, in Ukraine, um, she uh, continues to have a focus on this Indo-Pacific strategy, and she has said publicly, and she's also told you know, lots, of, uh, lots of partners uh, um, directly that, um, that she's sticking to the plan, which is for Canada to launch an Indo-Pacific strategy, which would have uh, defense and security, geopolitical, diplomatic, uh, commercial, and cultural uh, and academic dimensions to it. And I think what we're going to see is a really big push led by the federal government to, uh, for Canada to ra really raise the level of its game in the region, which, um, which we're now calling uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, region, which has been kind of an evolution of terminology. If you look around uh, the world, uh, countries who are kind of like-minded with, uh, with Canada, on a variety of issues in uh, in Europe, uh, Japan, the U.S., uh, Australia, uh, they're they're all using this term Indo-Pacific to talk about the the region that you could also just call Asia or Asia Pacific, um, and uh, they've all all those other partners that I mentioned have come up with strategies, and eyes are kind of on Canada to do that. And the reason I think it's, it's particularly important is we see also from the business community with whom we have very close and broad contact uh, with the work that we do at the foundation, um, there is a realization that as Canada moves into what we hope is a post COVID era, uh, the biggest uh, potential gains in, in international trade and for Canada's prosperity are definitely going to be found in the Indo-Pacific region. And I don't need to, to explain that to, uh, to a CanCham HK audience, but just to let you know, this is the thing that I talk about and others for the foundation talk about a lot in the presentations that we're giving across the country is about the Asia opportunity. When you look at the growth rates uh, that are available in other markets that are more mature, slower growing in North America and Europe, um, or just kind of smaller volume of growth uh, in absolute terms in places like Africa and Latin America, Asia is really where the where the greatest potential is for Canadians to uh, to uh, you know grow their prosperity, and and so there's a, in spite of everything that's happening you know in Europe, that's really going to be a very strong focus for the year. And so at the foundation we have a number of things that we're working on that that we hope will will help us to make a contribution yeah. to help Canadians to really raise their game in, in dealing with the Indo-Pacific uh, region and the different, the very diverse different parts of it. Well, this is really encouraging, Jeff, uh, you know, and especially uh, encouraging, interesting for Canadians doing business with Asia and in Asia, um, but also encouraging for businesses uh, investing into Canada as well to hear about this. And you just mentioned earlier about this, these projects that you're working on. Uh, can you tell us maybe, you know, previously we had discussed a little bit about this. You had told me about two projects that are in particular quite interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more about these two projects? Um, 
perhaps start with the one that you mentioned about on universities? Yeah, I'm delighted, delighted to. So, so um, we have uh, at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, we have now formed a partnership with Universities Canada, which is the, the national association of 97 uh, universities across Canada um, and a substantial organization in, in its own right. Um, we formed a partnership to convene a, a conference. So this is the first time that this has really been done um, for Canadians in Asia. We, uh, we have a plan uh, that we're developing now, but th that I'm happy to talk about because I want the word, the word to get out and we'll be looking for partners and sponsors and participants for this to have what we're calling the Canada and Asia Alumni Conference. And the idea is to have the Canadian universities to reach out to their alumni who live around Asia, resident in Asia, and to invite them to this Canada and Asia conference. Uh, uh, we're targeting uh, Singapore as the venue and to hold it in February of next year. So February, 2023 in Singapore. And, uh, and the idea is the, the, uni the participating universities invite their alumni that they know of around the region. The universities are coming you know, with their own people. Um, we could have maybe up to three dozen university presidents from Canada participating along with key people uh, doing interesting work from those universities. And then we would layer onto that engagement from uh, chambers of commerce, from leading uh, Canadian companies, financial institutions, uh, you know, investors who are active in Asia, bringing in our diplomatic missions uh, from across Asia, our, our ambassadors, high commissioners, uh, consuls general, uh, professional associations of Canadians in the region, and institutions and associations who are partners for Canadians in the region. Get everybody together and do a three-day event where the first two days are plenary, so everyone is mixing with everyone else, we would aim to have the most compelling uh, speakers program that, that we can uh, put together of uh, leading uh, people from Canadian you know, government and business, um, but also people in Asia, leaders who are engaged in interesting initiatives with Canadians, and, and do that for the first couple of days. And then on the third day, the, the universities and the other organizations participating can do what they like with their own participants. And so there's something for everyone in this. And we will be coming out uh, very shortly with more detailed information on this, but I'd be happy to hear from anyone um, in, our, in our audience who's interested in, in knowing more about it, please please get in touch with me. Uh, there will be sponsorship opportunities. There will also be opportunities to participate. Uh, our our uh, audience is already quite <laughs> interested. Yeah. But uh, one, one of the audience has just asked, uh, uh, why Singapore and why not Hong Kong? Yes. <laughs> well, I, to be honest, it, 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 and, and you know, this is just Hong Kong people, right? So don't- uh, <laughs> Sounds like it. Don't tell, you know, the Singapore, I'm thrilled about Singapore, uh, but it, it breaks my heart. Uh, Hong Kong, um, you know, in another era, just a few years ago, would absolutely be the place to do this for the first time because of so many alumni of Canadian education in Hong Kong. But uh, unfortunately, the, the political conditions are, are just not there to do it. And not just from a, from a government of Canada participation point of view, because we're, we're hoping to get, you know, very senior, uh, you know, political leadership from Canada to participate in the conference. But also, frankly, some of the some of the universities um, have uh, had concerns about that as well. Uh, Singapore is a place. Uh, there's going to be a big focus. This this Indo-Pacific strategy that we expect to see from the government of Canada this year, um, I predict, will have a strong focus on expanding Canadian engagement in Southeast Asia as part of diversifying Canada's you know, supply chains and investment partners, uh, sources of investment and, and trade and innovation yeah. partnerships. And so Singapore uh, kind of hits the mark in terms of aiming at uh, stepping up Canadian engagement in Southeast Asia. And the universities are keen on Singapore also for the same, the same reason they want to expand their networks in that region. Now, the other project I, I wanted to mention just, just yeah. very briefly is that uh, we are building up um, a new initiative. We have, as some of you know, um, some of the key data sets on Canadian engagement in Asia uh, through our investment monitor series of reports and analysis. 
We are the authoritative source of information about foreign direct investment coming into Canada from Asia, where it's coming from in Asia, where it's going to in Canada. We also have data on a uh, footprint of where Canadian businesses are across Asia and other information about people to people flows and uh, municipal twinnings and, and, and these, uh, these kinds of things. And, and the initiative uh, to help Canadians to raise their game in Asia is to take this, these data sets, keep them updated and build them. Um, we're gonna add information about research partnerships where you have academic papers co-authored by a researcher from a university in Asia and one from Canada. We'll be able to show this through a mapping tool, through vis visualization with the geographic information system uh, so that you'll be able to click on a province or a state or a, a city in Asia and see and explore all these different linkages. And we're gonna layer on top of that, a new service building on our Asia Watch newsletter, where we will have researchers who are tracking news developments at the, at the sub-national level, so at the local level across uh, different jurisdictions in Asia, uh, by looking through local language media sources and social media, uh, business announcements, government announcements, as well as international media, and uh, updating these things in real time so that we will be able to provide a suite of products and services for companies and investors um, uh, who are uh, doing business in Asia to get more information about what's happening on the ground in the places they're interested in. And we're gonna do this with a focus on environmental and social and governance developments, which uh, you know, everyone knows is, a, is kind of where the puck is heading to in terms of business engagement, new investments, and stakeholder concerns that businesses have. So this is the big thing we're working on. Similarly, I would love to hear from anyone who's interested in knowing more about this because we're just at the development stage, but we're, we're also doing our market research to see where we might have some interest in bespoke services that would be associated. A, a portion of this would be free as a public good for Canadians, but a portion of it, we're gonna develop some premium services around that to help uh, Canadians uh, to engage better in Asia and Asians to engage, people based in Asia to engage better in Canada. Well, oh, that's excellent. No, it's great to hear. We're, we're actually getting quite near at the end of our uh, session. It's just, time has just mm -hmm. flown by, but, uh, and we had a lot of questions and I have to mm -hmm. apologize to the audience that I couldn't uh, answer all of them, but you mentioned ESG there. And also mm -hmm. you mentioned that, that parts of it will be free. So those were the big questions that came up from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sustainability is what people are quite interested in these, uh, these days and, and going forward. But uh, near, near the end now, as I said, I wanted to thank you, Jeff, for your time. I know it's a very busy time for you. In the last two weeks, you've been in Ottawa, California. You were in Asia. You didn't tell us, but you were in Asia. I, I was in the other. I was in the other place uh, that we don't <laughs> that we don't mention. <laughs> And, for, and, for an and APEC you're, meeting. <laughs> you're in the middle of your uh, board meetings here as well. So yeah. we've got a couple of breakout sessions, uh, four breakout sessions, but I, I think you might have to skip them because of your board meeting. So uh, yeah. uh, but thank I you for taking that. time out to speak with us. I want to thank the audience as well for participating and for joining us for this uh, seventh ses session of the eighth TransPAC. Um, and um, just the last bit you mentioned there, if you want to connect with Jeff, uh, or myself uh, on any of this, uh, please feel free to do so through LinkedIn. Okay, so thank you, Jeff. Thanks for your time. Um, and that was great. Hope that to see you in Asia soon. Absolute pleasure, Alex. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you again in the near future and then drop by and see us if you're, if you're in Vancouver. Definitely will. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.